That worked out. Yeah, I think so. We're live now. I hope we're in the right one. Are we in the right one? I really no. hope so. I hope we're in the right live. Um, yes, we are. Okay. I think we are. Yes, we are. Okay. That's good. Okay, so I'm going to go over the headlines here. Um, what do I want to do? Just do that. And do this. Let's see. Go through this. Okay, so there's a 16-year-old girl who's missing from a sleepover, and she doesn't have shoes. I'm going to put her picture up here. Let's make it a little bigger. California authorities have asked for the public's help in locating the 16-year-old girl who vanished on Thursday night. Trinity Bacchus left a Nevada County home while wearing pajamas with a maroon robe. The missing girl's aunt, Ashley Jorkland, said that she was sleeping over at her home and she was not wearing any shoes when she disappeared. So she was sleeping at her aunt's house and her aunt knows that she wasn't wearing any shoes when she left, just her pajamas and a maroon robe. Her friend was also sleeping over at the time, and she doesn't know where the girl went. She thought Trinity was coming back. She's described as five foot nine, weighing 130 pounds, having red hair and green eyes. Nevada County Police say more than a dozen agencies are assisting in the ongoing search, and anyone with information should call the Nevada County Sheriff's Non-Emergency Dispatch Center at 530-265-7880. Wow, oh, she's found. Now, we remember we talked about that poker player, woman poker player that was killed. Well, there's some more information. A Michigan man was sentenced on Thursday to life in prison for the 2020 murder of professional poker player Susie Zahau. A jury took less than an hour to convict sex offender Jeffrey Morris, who is 62, of first-degree premeditated and felony murder. During the trial, it was revealed that he arred, tortured, and burned Susie, 33 at the time, alive due to his infatuation with brutalizing Asian women. In July 2020, Susie's charred remains were found discovered at a parking area near Pontiac Lake State Recreation Area. She was known in the professional poker circuit as Susie Q. She had moved from California to Michigan to be with her family and to deal with some issues in her personal life. Those close to her initially believed she was having substance abuse issues. However, they did not learn until after her death that she had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. At the time of her murder, police suggest gambling debts may have played a role. A close friend recalled Susie Q living out of her car, kicking her out of her car shortly before her murder due to her peculiar behavior, which they thought stemmed from drugs. She wanted me to pick her up at the McDonald's across the road, which I thought was weird. I had my daughter in the back seat, and she was going and unrolling the window, turning up the music. Excuse me, she was rolling up the, unrolling the window, turning up the music, turning it down, and at one point she acted as if she was being choked, and it just scared me. Susie's mother later picked her up, but Susie ended up leaving and was picked up by Morris, who apparently took her to the Sherwood Motel in Waterford Township before murdering her. She was alive when Morris bound her wrists with zip ties, covered her in gasoline, and lit her on fire. She also sustained substantial injury to her genitals, which were caused by Morris. Friends say that Susie's mother was devastated by her daughter's murder and no longer lives in the country. State records indicated that Morris is a Tier 3 sex offender with a 1989 conviction for third-degree criminal sexual conduct, force, or coercion. Morris... Um, said in court that he plans to appeal the mandatory life sentence. Judge Martha Anderson 
said while handing down the sentence, you took advantage of an individual who was fragile and basically destroyed everything she had accomplished in her life. Gosh, what a sinister man. Okay, that's just horrible. Hers for her family, wow. Okay, let's go to, whoops, next one. Okay, here's another one. This lawyer is unhappy about... Unhappy about his wife's pregnancy, so he decides to lace her drinks with abortion drugs. He was indicted this week for allegedly giving his pregnant wife abortion-inducing medications without her knowledge. Mason Herring is 38 and the managing, managing partner of Herring Law Firm put the drug in water that he gave to his wife on more than one instance. The couple had split in early 2022 and the woman discovered that she was pregnant in February. Harris County Assistant Prosecutor Anthony Osso said Herring was not happy about his wife's pregnancy. Nevertheless, he lectured him his wife, about keeping hydrated while pregnant. According to Osso, on March 17th, Herring gave his wife breakfast and water and insisted he was not going to leave until she drank that water. She thought it was odd. She thought the water was cloudy. She questioned him a little bit, but nonetheless, she did drink that water, and then he leaves and takes that cup. Herring's wife reportedly became seriously ill after the encounter, and doctors could not identify the cause. And the woman became suspicious of Herring, and instead of drinking the water he gave her, she kept it as evidence the next time. At some point, Herring's wife installed surveillance cameras at their home, even though she was no longer living there. Herring's wife searched trash cans on April 24th, and she discovered Cyrux, a medication that contains misoprostol, a drug that induces abortions. It was two days later when Herring was filmed putting a powder into his wife's water. The wife contacted authorities who arrested Herring on charges of assaulting a pregnant person and assault force induction to have an abortion. Six water samples were sent to a lab in Oklahoma, which reportedly determined that at least two of them contained that. Herring's wife gave birth to a girl. While the baby was born a bit early, she was said to be doing well. He on the other hand, is doing court on December 2nd. And let's just look up something really fast. Let's look up Herring Law Firm in Texas. This is funny. This is um, I'm going to make this smaller. Shoot. So I'm looking. This is his from his LinkedIn. Okay. I'll show you the picture that's on his LinkedIn. Huh? How different. So it says, I grew up in the greater Houston area, attended Texas A&M University, and graduated from South Texas College of Law. When I graduated from law school, I was fortunate enough to work for the Honorable S. Maurice Hicks in the Western District of Louisiana, Shreveport Division. I then started litigating on behalf of the small business owner and individuals facing adversity. My clients have called me their go-to lawyers in the Permian and Eagle Ford Shale dedicated and hardworking, whether it is fighting for a family's mineral rights, their injured loved ones, or taking on the largest insurance company in the world for a mom and pop construction business, I enjoy all types of significant litigation. Attorneys do not often talk about their morals and values, the qualities that steer their lives, 
Let me tell you a little bit about mine. My grandfather is a lifelong Texas oil field worker, and he has always told me anything worth having in life is worth working for. If it ain't worth working for, it ain't worth having. And tough times exactly. in the oil field don't last. Tough people do. I approach all my cases with that attitude. If I'm fortunate enough to have you as a client, you will have my full and undivided attention. I am an Eagle Scout, and I still believe in the Scout motto, always be prepared. When you hire me, I will prepare relentlessly and advocate on your behalf. I like to dig down in the trenches and solve problems rather than sitting around philosophizing, philosophizing how the problem will could potentially be solved. I believe strongly in the value of communication, not only with clients, but also opposing counsel. In the day and age of email and texting, I believe picking up the phone or having a face-to-face -face conversation can oftentimes lead to more productive outcomes. Hmm. So that doesn't sound like what he did. Okay, let's go to the next thing here. Now, John Bonet Ramsey, a new investigation launches into the 1996 murder of the little six year old. So let's see what's going on there. In that case, we're going to find it. Find it. Um, Tammy, we're live. I know. Oh, okay. The 1996. <laughs> Okay. Carolyn, I know. Okay. The 1990s. They're, they're going to find anything with that case. Okay. It's nothing new. There's nothing going on with that. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. The 1996 death of Colorado girl and beauty pageant winner John Benet Ramsey will be getting a new investigation as the anniversary of her death nears. In a statement on Wednesday, the Boulder Police Department announced its partnership with the Colorado Cold Case Review Team as the 26th anniversary of John Benet Ramsey's homicide approaches. Since John Benet's murder, detectives have investigated leads stemming from more than 21,000 tips, letters, and emails. We have traveled to 19 states to interview or speak with more than 1,000 individuals, say the Boulder Police Department. And they um, put this down there, and this was tweeted as well, this statement from the Boulder Police Department by John Andrew Ramsey. John Bonet, again, was killed in December of 1996. I think everybody knows this case inside her family's Boulder home. Police found her in the basement, lying face up with her mouth closed with duct tape and a nylon cord wrapped around her wrists and neck. There was no forced entry in the home, but police discovered the basement window unlocked. Investigators determined that she had been hit over the head and she had been essayed. John Bonet's family told investigators they found a ransom note inside their house which demanded a $118,000 payment. It remains unclear who wrote that letter. Although her parents, Pat and John Ramsey, were initially considered persons of interest, they were both publicly cleared. No suspects have been charged with her murder. This crime has left a hole in the hearts of many. We will never stop investigating until we find John Bonet's killer, Police Chief Maris Harold said on Wednesday. This includes following up on every lead and working with our policing partners and DNA experts around the country to solve this tragic case. This investigation has always been and will continue to be a priority for the Boulder Police Department. John Bonet had become a queen in the beauty pageant realm prior to her death. She was crowned at five pageants countrywide at only four years of age. She shined as the Colorado State All-Star Kids cover girl, then appeared just a few months later at the Little Miss was it Char Charlie Vox pageant in Michigan. John Bonet continued to win Little Miss Colorado, America's Royal Miss, and National Tiny Miss Beauty over the years. Many crime sleuths have tried to connect her death in some way to her competition in these other child beauty pageants. Anyone with information on the case should contact the Boulder Police tip line 303-441-1974. Um, so we'll see what happens with that, I guess. I don't know. 
Well, now we're going to go to the OnlyFans girl. Okay. Attorneys for her, for her, uh, that's Courtney Clenny, who's accused of killing her boyfriend, say that she had bruises all over her body after physical abuse at the hands of the man she killed. She was 26. She was arrested earlier this year in August after police found her in Hawaii. She was brought back to Miami to stand trial for the death of 27-year-old Christian Obamselli, who died in April at the couple's Miami high-rise. Clenny, who's often known as Courtney Taylor online, has claimed self-defense in the case. Photos released by the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office this weekend. Hold on a minute. Where's this? Hold on. Your life. Oh my gosh, shut this thing. It's driving me crazy. Um, what was I now? Photos uh, were released. They were taken by her mother, and one of the defendant's defense lawyers alleged the photos were consistent with a struggle for life. Prosecutors, however, argued that the crime scene was inconsistent with self-defense. Both the prosecution and her defense team have claimed the parties were victims of abuse. While the state alleges that Clenny abused the victim, and the defense claimed that the victim abused Clenny. The police observed no visible injuries, which would have corroborated her account, and she had no injuries. The defense attorneys argue that the evidence of self-defense would be presented at her trial. She reportedly claimed that she stabbed Obamselli in self-defense after he began choking her. Investigators initially accepted that story, but after a four-month investigation, they have charged her with second-degree murder. Clenny was allegedly threatening to kill herself when police found Obamselli's body. She was subsequently hospitalized under Florida's Baker Act, which allows authorities to send someone with violent or suicidal tendencies to a mental health treatment center for up to 72 hours. What prompted the alleged spat is not known publicly, but the couple is said to have fought often in their two-year relationship. In July 2020, police arrested Clenny in Las Vegas on a charge of battery after she allegedly threw a glass at Obamselli. In August, Clenny's lawyer, Frank Preto, wrote that the state's decision to show the elevator video was an attempt by the government to prejudice and taint potential jurors against the defendant and prevent her from receiving a fair trial. Okay, so did on that. And... This guy, we saw this guy yesterday. The suspect, um, the South Carolina man right there, charged with murdering his girlfriend and their newborn baby. The bodies of Clarissa Winchester, who's 22, and her newborn son were discovered at a Marietta home on Wednesday after Greenville County received a 911 call regarding a missing woman. The coroner determined that Winchester died from blunt force trauma to the head and neck while the son's cause of death is pending. Tyler Wilkins, 21, was originally arrested for failing to provide medical care for the baby, who police described as a recently born fetus. Authorities claim he is the father of the deceased child. According to authorities, Wilkins held Winchester captive at, his home, at the home on Wednesday and assaulted her in a manner which led to her death. In December of 2021, Wilkins was charged with aggravated domestic violence, attempted murder, and possession of a weapon during a violent crime. And he was released in January after posting $4,000 bond. The mother of Jordan Nebling, who was 21, said Wilkins was romantically linked to her daughter at the time she vanished in October of 2020. The day she disappeared, Wilkins allegedly picked her up at a traveler's rest because her car broke down. Wilkins reportedly told police they got into an argument. After going to his place, she left, and she remains unaccounted for. Wilkins has not been charged in connection with Nebling's disappearance. In regards to the latest case, he remains jailed without bond. And I think they should, uh, must be, really going to look into this because this is the woman that was missing after he picked her up. So, it sounds like he has a... Um, history. And then we have this guy. Nineteen year old college student brutally murdered his grandfather and injures his father. In Florida, of course, deputies 
arrest 19-year-old Georgia College student early Wednesday morning for attacking two family members and killing one and injuring the other. It was just before 3 a.m., according to a 911 call, that reported a man at her front door claiming that he had been attacked. The victim told the arriving deputies that he believed the suspect had attacked another member of the family as well. Deputies went there and they found the suspect standing near a man on the floor who appeared to be severely injured or possibly dead. Deputies ordered the suspect, later identified as Luke Ingram, out of the house. He complied with that order but refused further commands to turn around and or kneel, and after a tense five-minute standoff, deputies tased Ingram, and he fell to the ground. Once secured, he could be heard on the deputy's body camera telling them to kill me, kill me. Fire and rescue personnel entered the home, pronounced the second victim dead just before 3.30 a.m. The victim was Ingram's grandfather, 85-year-old Darwin Larry Ingram. The injured victim was Luke Ingram's father, Clint Ingram. The sheriff's office said Ingram attempted to escape after he was brought to the Flagler County Courthouse. He reportedly pulled his handcuffed arms through his legs and attacked an attack detectives and deputies after a significant struggle and multiple taser deployments, he was once again subdued and transported to the Advent Health Palm Coast for medical clearance before being taken to Sheriff Perry Hall Inmate Detention Center. A detective was also treated at the Advent Health and released. Ingram, who's from Dunwoody, Georgia, has been charged with second-degree murder, domestic violence, battery by strangulation, resisting without violence, resisting with violence, and aggravated battery on a law enforcement officer. He's being held without bond. The Flagler County Sheriff Rick Staley said the crime scene inside the home reflected a very violent and brutal attack. We are working diligently to find answers as to what caused this tragic attack on family members early this morning. Our condolences to the family and all involved in this case. Investigators provided no further information about the fatal attack itself, although Staley said Ingram's mental state likely paid, played a role. This is still part of the investigation, and ultimately it's going to be up to the courts to determine that part of any case, the sheriff said. According to the arrest report, Luke Ingram suffers from schizophrenia. The report said he had been acting strangely while at college in Georgia, and family members persuaded him to come to the Palm Coast. He arrived at the house on Tuesday evening and spent dinner staring at a family member. During the night, his father awoke to the sounds of screaming and found his own father bloody and unresponsive. Luke was sitting in a chair. Clint Ingram began to call 911, telling his son he needed help. But Luke attacked him and choked him before he freed himself and ran to the neighbor's home. Ah, that's crazy. And then we have a missing 18-year-old that was found deceased in Peoria, Illinois, from the University of Illinois. So, 18-year-old... Devin Lane was found deceased in the 5500 block of North Graceland in Peoria, Illinois, where he was pronounced dead at the scene. He was last seen Friday at around 9.30 p.m. in the 4500 block of North Sterling, and he was reported missing on Wednesday. The death is under investigation. The cause of death is not yet known, according to the Peoria County Coroner, Jamie Harwood. The search for Devin Lane has come to an end. Sadly, the 18-year-old University of Illinois student, who was reported missing by his family, was found deceased this afternoon in central Peoria at an undisclosed location. Devin's mother reportedly said he was last seen Friday at a Chick-fil-A on North Sterling. She said he became emotional and ran into the woods and then later tried to book a hotel room at the Spring Hill Suites but never showed up. Devin then tried to contact his grandmother, who lives in Peoria, but she didn't answer the phone, his mother said. Information regarding the mail, as well as the manner of death, will be released by the Peoria County Coroner. Anyone with information is urged to call Detective Chavez at 309-494-8356.
And then here's the X Playboy Bunny one that we're going to do. Uh, this is a weird case that I kind of looked into after seeing this. A former Playboy Bunny and Maxim model entered a plea deal this week in the death of a 71-year-old psychiatrist who paid $3,200 per month per month rent until he abruptly stopped in 2018. Her name is Kelsey Turner, 28. She entered an Alfred play in the case, which means that she still insists she's innocent, but agrees that a conviction is highly likely and that she'll take the punishment, which will be 10 to 25 years in prison. Now we know Michael Peterson did that too. The body of Thomas Bouchard was found on March 7th, 2019, and it was stuffed into the trunk of Turner's Mercedes Benz, which had been abandoned in the Nevada desert. He had been beaten to death. Her ex-boyfriend, John Kennison, and Diana Pena were also charged in the case. Kennison previously pled guilty to murder and conspiracy, while Pena, the couple's roommate, pleaded guilty to conspiracy. Pena testified that she saw Kennison hit the Dr. Burchard with a bat and that Turner urged him to knock Thomas out. Authorities say that Bouchard had a relationship with Turner for some time and that he had been paying the rent where she, her two children, and mother lived in Salinas, California for a year. When he abruptly stopped paying the rent, the family was evicted and Turner moved to Las Vegas. Bouchard's longtime girlfriend, Judy Earp, reported him missing in early March, and she told investigators that he had flown to Las Vegas to visit Turner. He was not seen alive again. Turner entered a plea on Wednesday. Sentencing is scheduled for January 10th of 2023. Now, the girlfriend of the psychiatrist told the station she didn't think the sentence was enough for Turner, particularly if she's sentenced to the lower end of the scale. I don't think it's going to reform her at all. I don't think she's reformable. So I looked into this guy a little bit. I'm like, what the heck is this guy? You know, and he's got this girlfriend and what's going on here? Um, and it ended up that when I first saw an article about him, didn't mention anything about a relationship, didn't know what happened. And the girlfriend was talking up about like all they did and that, and what a great doctor he was and um, how he did magic tricks. And he would travel all over with that girlfriend, uh, Erp, Judy Erp all over and it just sounded like oh gosh you know it was this glorious thing but then she goes on um i think it was like shortly after that and says that he had this intimate relationship with this woman and he had been paying a rent up until i think it was like three hundred thousand dollars <coughs> so it's crazy but yeah she be sentence is very odd i might look into it further we'll see um and then we have anything else um we went over all that so i'm gonna call that the end of the true crime right now and i'm going to do a gallery and move the spotlight okay let me go back to the chat okay so live Hi, Heart May Wise. Hi, LMNW. And, um, let's see, GB, hi. I thought that's interesting to do that as well. I missed that. Where's Sharon? Nicole, are you up? I might be here. Oh, I oh well, there you are. I didn't see you. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Hello. Hi. Marky. Oh, because yeah, we... everybody's here, Carolyn. Okay, thanks, Tammy. We got a comment that um, we should make sure and take a roll call at the end and see who's awake. Exactly. Oh. Okay. Margot, are you here? I am. Okay, good. <gasps> Debbie D, are you here? No. Is Debbie D asleep? Probably. Uh, well, we can't, can't like can't hear her because she's, she's just like special. Well, she's. Well, Debbie D is special. 
Don't count that. Okay. All right. And I think that, what time is it? Oh, it's 3.10. All right. I think we're going to go to, um, probably go to the Zoom now for the rest of the night. Because um, we probably will have to auction tomorrow. I don't know what the, what, did you hear the weather, Nicole, what it's supposed to be like tomorrow? Rain. Oh, rain, rain again? I, think, I think. I don't think. I don't know. I hope not because we've got to get, we got to get some more. What? Carolyn, it's gonna can get we what? watch, um, what? Wait, hold on one minute. Is it, what'd you say? It's going to get what? It's going to start pouring. Like, just pour, like, like I think, but it's, it's going to be in the 70s. 70s. Yeah, but why got to get some work done outside? Let me see. Yeah. Rain, rain, and then it's 63 here. It was warm here today. My hair, yeah. yeah but I'm going to start a new Zoom before we leave. So I'm going to start a new Zoom. New Zoom. New Zoom. Sorry. <laughs> New Zoom. It just it it feels like a band aid. I just have to take it off and just start a new Zoom, right? All right. So we're gonna start a new Zoom, and uh, let me see. What am I doing? Copy invitation. Okay. And let me put it in Slack. And co-hosts, please come in because I'm going to retire to the massage chair very quickly. And so I've got so much to do. Oh my gosh, I'm so behind on email. Oh, I want to say something. Um, rough, rough, rough. Maybe you answer me if you got something because Jimmy sent the wrong thing to somebody again. Okay. All right. Hi, Eva. How are you? Okay. Um, oh. 40 miles in severe thin. Really? You have that, LMNW? Stay safe. Wait, wait what's going on? She on has that? 40 mile per hour winds and severe thunderstorm warning now here. We didn't have oh high winds. God. We didn't have any high winds. No high winds. Hi. 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 Where are you, DBC? Hi. 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 Here comes Sharon. Here comes Sharon coming through the door. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's funny. Oh. I fell asleep Hi, early. Wow. Hi. It's coming now, Hi. really, L M and W. I don't hear any wind. I heard some more rain earlier when we were when I was doing the um, reading. I don't know. I think it's supposed to be. Let me go check your wind. I'll check your wind on the camera. All right, but we'll see you guys tomorrow. Love you guys, and I'll keep you. Just keep looking for us. All right. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Love you guys. Prayers.